one. And welcome everybody to another Smart Money Circle update. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Michael Keogh, who's the CEO of Kinzel Capital Group, Inc. Ticker symbol is KNSL. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adam. It's glad to be here. I always like to ask, Mike, can you begin by telling us about your journey and how you got to where you are today? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, I had a father who's an insurance broker uh, coming out of law school uh, a couple decades ago. I was looking to get into real estate development. Uh, at the time, real estate was kind of going through a bit of a recession and um, ended up getting a job as a staff attorney and especially insurance company. And um here I am. <laughs> oh, <it's... laughs> a lot in between, but, uh, yeah. you know, basically uh, learning the business, taking on more responsibility and then being involved in a de novo startup and, uh, you know, with a private equity finance group. And then a number of years later, doing a second one uh, really uh, on my own initiative. Nice. I love that. And then tell us about your business, just in general overview and some of your competitive advantages, please. Yeah, so uh, the best way to think about the PNC or property casualty insurance is it's a large mature industry. Uh, it tends to grow with the economy a little bit faster than the economy. Um, within this big mature industry, though, there's a, a much smaller, uh, very dynamic market. We call it the non-standard market. Sometimes it's called the excess and surplus lines market or ENS for short. Sometimes it's referred to as the specialty market, but it's essentially a market for high hazard accounts that fall into when they can't bind or purchase coverage from your uh, standard lines insurance company. So uh, that could be brand new businesses that don't have the requisite track record. It could be a business that's engaged in a high hazard operation, a uh, demolition contractor, or maybe you manufacture sporting goods. It could be a business that's located in a very litigious venue. Uh, ENS companies like Kinsale tend to write the lion's share of their business in the more litigious states. You know, think California, Texas, Florida, New York. Um, and a lot of times it's poor loss history. But regardless, ENS companies exist to uh, service these high hazard accounts. And we are able to do that by uh, charging higher rates and offering more restrictive coverage. It's an important regulatory note to uh, understand that ENS companies are exempt from most of the rate and form regulation that standard companies are subject to. So we can, uh, if you will, charge what the market will bear in the way of a price. We can negotiate the coverage on a risk by risk basis. And that flexibility uh, in underwriting allows us to offer, you know, very bespoke uh, solutions for uh, business owners. Mostly we service commercial accounts. I love it. That sounds fantastic. And then let's talk about risk. You're obviously in the risk management business and you've got a fair amount of risk. How do you handle risk, both from a professional standpoint and underwriting standpoint, but within the organization as well, and also in the market? So I guess if you can speak about risk we greatly appreciate it. And then what mistakes do you see people make with respect to risk management? Yeah, so, uh, you know, risk is, uh, obviously, it's an integral part of our business. I think our really our business strategy um, really sets the foundation for how we manage risk. Um, we focus exclusively on the non-standard market or the ENS market, which historically has offered up not only better growth prospects, but better margins. Um, we focus on smaller accounts really for the same reason. It's interesting as accounts grow in size, the level of competition grows exponentially. And consequently, the margins for the risk bearer get compressed, right? So uh, for that reason, we, we, we do focus on smaller accounts. I think our average premium runs in the, in the $15,000 per policy range. Okay. And then um, most companies that write small accounts like we do, uh, struggle with the volume of transactions. It's a very high volume in order to build a good sized book of business, $15,000 at a policy. And if you just look at Ken sales numbers for last year, we had over 600,000 new business submissions that came in from our brokers around the United States. We sent out over 400,000 quotes. We bound 40 or 50,000 of those. 
uh, you know, another 50 or so thousand renewal policies. And we finished the year with about 457 full-time employees. So I would just argue anecdotally, that's a that's a really modest headcount given the high volume of transactions. Our, our, our competitors don't handle it that way. They outsource the underwriting to specialty brokers around the, the United States. And that, that's a model that's been in existence for many years, but it comes with an embedded conflict of interest because brokers get paid based on premium volume, not profitability. And so when you delegate underwriting authority to commission salespeople, you do create a misalignment of interest. And that shows up sometimes in the form of a higher loss ratio. So, um, you know, can sales able to maintain absolute control over our underwriting? We never, ever delegate that outside of our company. Um, and we can handle the high volume of transactions and we can do it with a, a relatively modest headcount in large part because we've got the best uh, handle on technology and automation in our in our industry. Um, we, we we were a de novo startup 14 years ago, and in starting the business, we decided to make technology a core competency alongside of underwriting and claim handling. And today, that's paying really uh, interesting dividends to us in the form of uh, again being able to control our operating our our, our operation, but at the same time we operate with a very low expense ratio in the in the last quarter in the second quarter of this year can sales expense ratio so that's that's our commissions that we pay our brokers and our operating expenses uh, over our earned premium that was 21 cents on the dollar most wow. of our competitors that that like us target the small account market are in the mid 30s to low 40s and in a commodity business like insurance that's a that's an almost an unbelievable advantage. I think it's analogous to what Geico and Progressive have done in the personal auto space mm -hmm. for 30 plus years. They've used that efficiency, not to not just to deliver best in class returns, but also to uh, take market share from competitors. I think if you look back 25 years ago, Progressive may have been two and a half percent of the personal auto market. And I think today they're approaching 15 percent. It's a little Probably. bit about what can sales doing. Yeah, I love it. So uh, they're showing up in the numbers. I mean, your early, your quarterly growth is fantastic. Double digits the last three quarters. Sales growth is double digits. Return equity is uh, 30% the last quarter. Your expect expectations, 45% growth next year earnings per share. And the year after, another 22%. So year over year, quarter over quarter, you've got phenomenal, phenomenal growth. So super well done. And to explain to the audience what you just said is that you're looking after a, almost like a blue ocean, red ocean, where the red ocean is full of sharks more higher competition, the blue ocean would be less so. And you're going after the more risky, if you will, they're not really more risky, but they kind of are deemed risky by the big boys and girls or the bigger sharks. And you're going after the blue ocean because you can process those higher volume. You've got the infrastructure to handle that capacity, whereas other people struggle. And you've got higher margins because you're not going after the red ocean where the margins are compressed. Is that a good way of summarizing what you just said? Yeah. Yeah, if you look at it in the commercial space, so the PNC market, I think, is approaching a trillion dollars annually. It's a little bit less than that. It's about 50-50 personal lines and commercial lines. And that commercial piece, you know, 400, I, I, to be honest, I don't know the exact number, call it four, four or five hundred billion dollars of annual premium. It's about 50-50, I'm sorry, it's about 80-20 standard versus non-standard market. So we're in a market that I think this year might be 115 billion or so of premium. And if you look at our numbers from last year, we're about 1.1. If you annualize our six month numbers for 2023, we're somewhere around 1.6. So a little over 1% of, you know, a pretty substantial market with some, again, almost unbelievable expense advantage. You know, we're, we're in a business where, um, you know, if you sell Swiss watches or Italian sports cars or custom suits, the fact that the product is expensive is part of why you're buying it. We're the complete opposite of that. People buy insurance because they have to. Small businesses buy insurance because they have to to operate their businesses. Right. And so they're price buyers. More than anything else, they want low cost. Right. And so for us to operate at a 21% expense ratio, we've got competitors 10, 15, 20 points higher. 
it's it's I'll just say it. I think it's it's almost an unbelievable advantage, um, especially given the fact that we've been in business now. This is our fourteenth year in business, and um, I think it speaks to the challenge that old line insurance companies have in modernizing their systems and their business process and their use of automation. You know, pushing repetitive tasks away from people and into the software of the business in order to uh, to be more efficient and in order to reduce cost. And um, as a de novo startup 14 years ago, again, we, we made that a big priority. And so uh, it, it really does seem, at least for the foreseeable future, that Consale is in a pretty interesting environment. We're in a, a higher margin segment of our industry. It's a, it's a segment that's growing at a good clip. And we've got these these uh, competitive advantages, again, that seem to have real durability to them. Up in the number, right? Since I think every single year in the last four or five years, you've been not just profitable, but you've been growing your profits year over year. I see $1.79 and 18, 241 and 19, 316 and 20, 574 and 21, 780 and 22, 1131 expected this year and 1380 next year. So phenomenal growth. I mean, just the, the proof is in the pudding. It is. And again, if you know, if if investors look back at what Progressive and Geico have done in the personal auto space. That's that's one of the complaints about uh, that that we hear at Kinsale, you know, when we talk to investors, because Kinsale does trade at a at a pretty lofty multiple. It's probably uh, you know somewhere around thirty times, I think, forward earnings and maybe a little bit more. And you know, sometimes investors look at insurance companies as a multiple of book value, and uh, on the book measurement, we trade at quite a premium to our competitors. But um, you know, again, you you look back at a uh, at a company like Progressive 25 years ago, if you could have purchased that stock today, you know, at that price, even though it was trading at a rich multiple back then, you know, there's no investor in the world that would turn down that opportunity. 100%. And so, you know, I think there's a little bit of that uh, dynamic in play with Kinsale. No, I, I mean, I, anyone tells you they have a high multiple, they just, they don't understand the growth component, in my humble opinion, because the growth is more than justifies that high multiple and then some. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about some timeless lessons that you've learned, Michael, along the way that you'd like to share with the audience. Uh, you know, um, the foundation, I think, in our business and, and probably most businesses is people. And, um, you know, it's there's an I'll make an interesting observation. If you if you look at the history of the PNC industry and you compare it to other financial service businesses, so money center banks, community banks, life and health companies, broker dealers, asset managers, specialty lenders, you know, there's all these different financial related businesses. It's interesting how often when you compare the returns that PNC is ranked either at the bottom or near the bottom, right? right? It's a, it's an industry renowned for mediocrity. And, um, well, you know, said that. say that again. Well said, very well said. <laughs> now the, the anomaly is that within this, uh, industry renowned for mediocrity, there are these kind of top quartile or quintile outperformers that tend to just create a, a lot of wealth, you know, year after year after year. And I think I think Progressive and Geico are great examples of that. Uh, there's, there's specialty companies like Arch Capital, Renaissance Re. I mean, there's a lot of examples. Uh, RLI, another specialty company. Lots of examples of companies that have done really good things, even in this, if you will, under underperforming industry. And um, cl clearly, that's what we aspire to do here at Consale. But the uh, <laughs> the 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 analogy with regard to people is this, though: um, if you work for a company, uh, your your economics, if you will, your opportunity, your compensation is a function of your own efforts and your ability and your success, but it's also derivative of the um, performance of the business. Right. And so if you work for an underperforming business, even if you're a great worker and, and you know really smart, you are perpetually handicapped in that the, the fact that you, your company that you work for is not a great company, it limits your economics, your upward mobility, right? Your opportunity to take on more responsibility. And um, as a consequence of that, I think there's this dynamic where 
the best and the brightest in some of these underperforming companies leave and go elsewhere because they've got options. And then you think about, well, who stays at the underperformer, you know, in perpetuity? And sometimes it's the people that have less options. Maybe they're not as talented. Maybe they don't work as hard. Um, maybe they've got other priorities in life, right? Who knows? But I, I do think it, become, it becomes a, a um, if you will, a, a vicious cycle where an underperforming business can result in an underperforming workforce that begets more uh, business underperformance, if you will. And 100%. I think the reverse is also true. Yeah. That a company that focuses on being really good at what it does, serving its customers, managing costs, innovating, never being complacent, it can do really interesting things for its employees, which of course, that's where the success comes from. And it makes it really attractive for your better employees to stay the course and build their careers, and it it results in a virtuous cycle. And so, you know, look, it's a long-winded way of saying we put a lot of emphasis on uh, rewarding the doers, recognizing achievement, and getting rid of underperformers. It's that old line from Jack Welch, if you remember from his GE era. Um, you've got to be you've got to be fair with employees and people that 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 deliver an outsized um, contribution to the business they have to be recognized they have to be compensated for that whether it's cash or whether it's cash and more responsibility um, and I think that's a real important part of being a manager in a business whether you're the CEO or you know a department manager or what have you um, yeah. the other thing is just you know technology is changing how all people communicate it, it changes uh, for, for us as individuals and of course, it's changing how businesses communicate with their customers, with their employees, other vendors, trading partners, and the like. And I think I think so much in in, in investment circles, investors tend to think of the tech industry. Right. Hey, tech is interesting. We're going to allocate X percent of our portfolio to tech. And it's like, look, tech's changing the restaurant business. It's changing garbage collection. It's changing media, it's changing financial services, right? It's changing everything. And some companies are more adept, more forward thinking in that regard, some are not. And um, I, I just think it's a reminder for investors not to get pigeonholed into thinking that um, if you wanna if you wanna see what techs, how t technology and automation and innovation is creating wealth for investors, yeah, Oracle's a great company, Microsoft, Apple, you know, all sorts of tech companies, but there are restaurant companies that are using technology to create wealth and trucking companies. And 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 clearly, I would tell you that Kinsale as a property casualty insurance company, um, a lot of our success is driven by our commitment to, you know, this idea of making technology a core competency of our business. No, I love it. I was going to say two things. One, in insurance companies like yourself also, we can add to the list. And yeah. then the second, we have a saying around here with our investor relations side of the business is strength begets strength and weakness begets weakness. So I think, you know, Newton's law of motion kind of kicks into play with what you're talking about with people. And that's a great, great, great timeless lesson. Thank you for that. Sure. Timeless mistakes. Uh, you know, um, Managing people is a, is an uncertain business, right? Um, we all have strengths and weaknesses. We've all got things going in our on in our lives, not, not all positive every day, right? That we try to balance against our commitment to our employer. And so, um, you know, we talk about putting a lot of effort into rewarding the doers and that type of thing. It's critical, but it's an uncertain business. And um Somehow companies and, and managers within an organization, leaders need to figure out over time the right balance between, um, you know, maybe you got somebody in the wrong job and you got to make a change versus say, are you being patient enough? Um, you know, it's it's just an uncertain business. And I, I don't think there's an easy way to get to the right answer sometimes. It takes a lot of effort and experience. Um that's one thought. You know, our business is a little bit unique because we do socialize risk. 
and some of the risk we socialize is volatile. And volatility is something that investors don't like. And, um, you know, but they like the returns. So in, in our business, one of the more attractive margin businesses is what we call natural catastrophe business. So if you own a hotel on the beach in, in South Florida and we insure your building, uh, the margins for us as a risk bearer on that building are great. Um, but when you have a terrible windstorm, hurricane that hits Miami, right. um, you can have losses against a large percentage of your property portfolio, right? So you have to be very disciplined, even though a hurricane may only hit Miami once every 10 years or 25 years or 50 years, who knows? You have to manage that portfolio in the good years for, for the bad one, right? Yeah. That you know is going to come someday. You just don't know when. Right. So it requires a lot of discipline because you're foregoing, by limiting your concentration, you're foregoing a lot of return. You're giving up profitability year after year after year in small increments in order to uh, hey, when that bad storm hits Miami, you have a very attractive outcome and your stock trades in a, in a good fashion. Um, but that's where I think weaker managers sometimes get ahead of themselves. They're not disciplined in, in, in trading off short term for long. And of course, that can that can uh, result in a lot of heartache. I always love that Warren Buffett quote about when the tide goes out, right? Everybody's uh gets to see who's swimming naked. But um it's it's just uh it's just one of his million uh, folksy anecdotes that kind of captures the the challenge for a business uh, manager or leader. I love that. It's like look like the short term consequences of writing those uh, those insurance things, bringing a lot more money in the short term. But then when the hundred year flood happens, so to speak, or twenty year or fifty year flood, you get washed out and then you're toast. Whereas yeah. if you forego it and you plan for it, when the rain comes in, you're fine because you have enough of a cushion built up. Yeah. So it's almost like eating a cookie where it gives you short-term gratification, but long-term pain. If you eat a cookie all day, every day, it's not good. But short-term, it feels good, but long-term, it's not. So I get and, that. And there's a million applications of that, right? Companies sometimes get ahead of themse themselves with leverage. Hey, it's a great way to juice your returns when business is going well. But if you go through a challenging, stressful period, that leverage can create insolvency, yep. um, you know? Um, lots of examples, but clearly in the insurance business, you know, risk management is just a fundamental skill that we have to be really experts at in order to produce returns that are attractive over the long term. Yeah, totally agree. So let's talk about leadership, Michael. What are some, uh, I guess, the some lessons you've learned from being a great leader or just great leadership lessons in general that you'd like to share with us? Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of uh, leading by example. Um you know, there's been this huge trend the last couple of years coming out of the pandemic with um, companies adopting the the remote work, and it clearly can work quite well for a lot of businesses. Yeah, we're a business that uh, is is a little bit contrarian in that we moved all of our employees back to the office in October of 2020, mm -hmm. and um, you know there was a little bit of blowback. We did lose some some good employees that weren't comfortable, but uh, it was it's just such a um, important part of how we operate certain parts of our business like underwriting and claim handling and system development. Those tasks are collaborative in nature. And so sitting in an office with your team where you can share experiences is critical to us doing a good job. It allows us to maximize productivity. Uh, we're in growth mode. So as you would expect, we've been hiring a lot of new employees over the last several years. And we tend to hire new people to the industry as opposed to, as opposed to hiring from competitors. And so those new employees learn the business by working alongside experienced personnel. And, um, you know, if everybody were in their living room, you give that up. But, but I do think part of the reason a lot of companies have stayed wedded to that remote model is who in the organization has the second home down in Florida or in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, or what have you. It's the senior leaders, right? And they wanna work out of the vacation home or the ski home or what have you. And I just, I just think it's a great example where, hey, leading by example is important. And um, 
if you tell your company, hey, uh, managing expenses carefully is fundamental to our success in our business, then I don't think it makes sense for me to be jumping on private airplanes all day long. Um, if we need to be in the office in order to execute our plan and serve our customers and train new employees, then I don't think it makes sense for me to be in my vacation home all summer. I think it makes sense for me to be here in the office, right. just like everybody else. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's a drag, but I think leading by example is just um, a really critical part of being uh, good at good at what you do if you're in a um, some sort of managerial role within a company. Love that. And let's talk about adversity. What some uh, obstacles you've overcome in your journey, or how do you handle adversity? Uh, you know, well, uh, <laughs> you know, insurance, like all businesses, is hyper competitive. Uh, so it's not unusual. You've got a competitor that's coming into your space where maybe we've grown our book of business and have produced really good returns. And hey, they're trying to squeeze those margins and take some of that uh, margin away from us. That can be frustrating. We're in a competitive labor market. We're an outperformer financially. So we're a target for a lot of new capital that's come into our industry where their uh, new companies are spinning up and uh, they want to hire experienced personnel. You know, that can be frustrating, but, um, you know, not every product line we get into is a success. So staying on top of the profitability is important, but look, I, I just think tenacity, stick to itiveness, um, never being complacent, um, taking care of people that are good workers and making sure they're recognized for their hard work. Um, all those things, I think, just allow you to persevere through, you know, good days and bad. Um, you know, there's that Kipling poem. Um, I can't remember the damn name of it. Uh, um, but he's got a line in there about, uh, you know, success and failure and treat those two imposters just the same. You know, um, which is probably uh, what the thought that comes to mind at the moment. You got to be prepared for in the good times. You got to be prepared for the tough times. And I think as a business leader in the tough times, you got to be prepared for the good, uh, you know, because life does ebb and flow. Yeah, it's like red light, green light, where after every red light, there's a green light and vice versa. Yeah. Matthew McConaughey talks about that. Okay, wonderful. So final question for you, Michael, what is the best piece of advice you'd like to give to the audience or to your 30-year-old self? Uh, you know, integrity is fundamental. I think to success in business and just human relations in general. Uh, it's amazing to me. You know, I've worked for different companies over the last 30 or, or so uh, years. And it's amazing how many times you work with somebody in one organization. Years later, you're working with them again in a different capacity. And so, um, you know, treating your, your colleagues, your customers, your vendors, um with respect even if you've got disagreements right that's in that's that's inevitable in business right you have disputes disagreements conflicts but being able to work through that where you treat other people i think with courtesy and respect trying to always conduct your affairs with a sense of integrity um i think it pays so many practical dividends over the years you, it's just amazing so uh that's just my last uh, comment. I love it. I know it's been really, really fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Everybody can get more information at kinzelcapitalgroup.com. Is that correct? The website? That's correct. And the ticker symbol is KNSL. And hopefully Michael will speak to you again soon. This was really fantastic. Thanks, Adam. Enjoy Thanks. being with you. Likewise.